Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Newsflash. We have a good one for you, as always, on the show today. We are talking about the state of Michigan, a big result for uncommitted in the Michigan primary versus uh, Joe Biden, a really, you know, pretty strong representation, a pretty significant representation of what has been going on in Gaza and the Democratic basis, increasing disapproval with it. We'll go through the results from that. And also, I mean, maybe we'll touch on the uh, Demo- or Republican primary a little bit. Um, also, we're going to keep up the latest when it comes to the uh, beat by beat updates of what's going on in Rafa, uh, including a ex-Israeli prime minister will tell you which one uh, warning against a ground attack on the city. Uh, but we have a really good show for you today. And with us, joining us for today, we have uh, Myron Michaelides doing his first appearance. We, we often have him on uh, our UK news show, uh, Hell Island. So we're trying to get him back on hopefully next Tuesday. But then uh, always good to have someone who is just, I really have to say, incredibly knowledgeable about politics on both sides of the pond come in and talk do, do a little american politics as well so, so thank you very much for coming on today it's great to be here spencer i'm glad i've been uh promoted from the regional office of the podcast <laughs> all the way up to the big leagues yeah yeah the i don't state. know yeah pr- maybe pr- promoted <laughs> i don't know I wouldn't pr- maybe like a expanded role is what i would say yeah but um it, it, <laughs> yeah a lot of interesting stuff going on we had the uh michigan primary uh, and the results are in. I think the probably the more interesting thing is on the Democratic side, um, but definitely some weaknesses in the Donald Trump uh, performance as well, uh, where a not when all is said and done, not crazy, but definitely kind of a significant underperforming of the polls yet again for Donald Trump as we continue to see uh, you know around a third. Uh, this time it was a little less, around twenty six point six percent. With about 95% of the votes in. Um, so around a third of the party throughout all these days kind of continuing to say, oh, we want some kind of another option. Uh, but it just, again, it was a, a, a fair bit more uh, than that in 2016. And we saw the party kind of unite around Donald Trump. So it definitely you know doesn't put the outcome of this primary into any doubt. And I think with the things that we've seen going on, um, in Atlanta, with the prosecutor that's supposed to hire him, or is supposed to prosecute him, um, got in trouble essentially for having, um, you know, h- hiring her, uh, her, the a man who, uh, you know, she was essentially cheating with a married man, uh, hired him with, he didn't have the most experience, hired him into a pro- key prosecutorial role, uh, get paid by the state, uh, so definitely something that the Trump campaign has seized on, and, you know, honestly, rightfully so. Uh, it is a pretty crazy situation in that case. Uh, you know, that's most serious case. Probably can delay it more and more to the uh, you know to a prior to a point after the election. Um, meanwhile, Biden does continue to flounder because in the Democratic primary, it's some also some some very interesting results. But uh, first, we just do quickly before we kind of get into the Democratic primary. Uh, Myron, I do want to get your take on the on the uh, Republicans. Um, the Republican primary, I think, is, I mean, often it is kind of more the same, which, you know, the headline title is obviously that Donald Trump's won another primary. He's won it by, you know, a pretty big margin. I think it was around like 60%. But again, I mean, I think, you know, the main, I think, problem for him seen in this result is that, you know, he underperformed his poll uh, numbers for a fourth consecutive primary. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Haley didn't get quite as much, but, you know, still got a significant part, about 28%. And, you know, I think this shows the problem that, you know, even if, let's say, half of those people uh, voted for uh, Haley, you know, 15 to 20%, you know, either don't vote Biden or don't vote at all or become persuaded by Trump in the general, you know, still like 15 to 20% of your people not turning out in a very, very, very close race, that's going to be 2024. That's bad. That doesn't show that you're, you know, a higher, a high enthusiasm uh, candidate, you know, I, and I think when, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm always generally kind of bullish on Biden. But I think that, you know, when the guy who has a personality uh, uh, cult, you know, isn't getting as much enthusiasm as you, 
I think that's a pretty good sign. But, you know, it still means that he's probably going to be the nominee. But I think as the saying goes, you know, can't win a primary without Trump, can't win a general with him, I think is what we might see. Yeah, that that definitely is a situation that I feel like had it been any other Democrat, uh, you know, I would definitely be and really kind of any other situation. I feel like I really would be uh, uh, seeing a lot of your point on that, because it is it is definitely a situation where he does have that pretty, you know, it's a significant chunk. Uh, but also you get the sense of, you know, a lot of these primaries, especially the New Hampshire primaries, a great example of this. You have the open situation where, you know, Democrats or just people who aren't really a part of the just general Republican Party come in and, and vote. So I think that's definitely going to be uh, an interesting situation. But I think the the way you picked up on there with the enthusiasm is definitely a great um, a great, a great uh, place to to jump off with with Joe Biden because Biden comes in with eighty one point one. He's he's pro- crossing that eighty percent mark, which is a uh, pretty solid situation. But uh, it was a a bigger night than anyone really expected for uncommitted. Uh, we heard talk of maybe uh, ten thousand uh, to twenty thousand votes. I think that was what. Um, you know, that was what they set their expectations for. I'd say that was probably a little bit low, but they end up getting over 100,000 votes. The current uh, t- uh, total, as I'll get here in the New York Times, is 101,067. Uh, so really, really uh, going beyond probably even, you know, the most maximalist expectations you had. I think like Gretchen Whitmer and Joe Biden really trying to raise expectations, but uh, you also had you know, the people in uh, the Listen to Michigan campaign running this uncommitted campaign uh, go down. But I think, you know, this is definitely a very, very significant uh, result here, probably more significant uh, in terms of telling us where Biden's standing is in the election with Trump, because I think it really does with the uncommitted, you know, or president. I think you, if people are comparing this to, you know, Obama 2012, I think it is kind of an interesting comparison. You have way more turnout. Uh, you have about seven hundred sixty versus uh, seven hundred sixty thousand versus one hundred thousand. I let's check, take a look at this, um, but I think you and you have a pr- pretty substantially more, both numerically, and I think it's about three four percent more for uncommitted in you know the broader swing of things. It's not you know a kind of an earth shattering result, but uh, with just how close it was, you know one hundred fifty thousand votes Biden won Michigan uh, in twenty twenty four and ten thousand votes in. Uh, 2016, Hillary Clinton lost it. It's definitely going to be down to the turnout, down to the margins. And, uh, you know, even if these, it, it, you know, it's very safe to say that at least, you know, 100,000 people uh, who t- took the time to go get registered if they weren't already uh, be in that Democratic primary. We're getting reports, for example, out of, you know, the kind of Arab capital, really, of America, Dero in Michigan, that, uh, you know, they had to just reprint uh, and get a whole nother load of applications to register to vote because it really was. Uh, kind of pissing people off, and also reports of a lot of people just, you know, vote, showing their dissatisfaction by staying at home. I think this is going to be a really big blow uh, for Biden in terms of his chances at winning Michigan. And I don't think if you're in the Biden position, just you know, sacrificing Michigan at this point, mm-hmm. as we're seeing the polls are not looking good, you know, as well, is a very smart idea. What are, what are your thoughts on the uncommitted situation? I mean, I think I'm going to diverge pretty pretty radically from, from what I think we'll take. I think I think I think that. Um, obviously, kind of, you know, there was incredibly high turnout. I mean, I think it was like 40% of Hillary Clinton's turnout in the general election. So it was about 900,000 people turned out uh, in Hillary Clinton in 2016. You know, the total in the general election was about 2, 2,200,000. 2, so it's a very high turnout primary. Um, but I do think that kind of it is important to put it in perspective in the sense that you know, the the increase on uncommitted from Obama in 2012 was in percentage points, um, only about, you know, one to two percentage points. And while, you know, people are saying, you know, Hillary Clinton lost Michigan by two percentage points, and that's absolutely true. You know, Hillary Clinton also was really bad among uh, white voters, right? You know, Trump had about 60-40 uh, when it came to white voters. And a lot of these people, um, you know, especially with a lot of the votes for uncommitted coming around Ann Arbor, where the university is, you know, a lot of these people are younger, you know, more likely mm-hmm. to be kind of people of color. And so, you know, I don't think that this uncommitted actually shows a real disruption when it comes to white moderate voters who are, you know, 
a much bigger kind of portion of the Michigan electorate who I think is still with Biden. And I think the fact that you've had such a high turnout race and in areas like Detroit, where you really need turnout, you know, Biden's absolutely you know crushing it. I think that I, I think that it definitely is going to be hyped up. And I think that definitely the cable news cycle is definitely looking at kind of, you know, a big threat to Biden. Um, but I think that it will I don't think that it is as big as people think. I got a, someone's knocking on my door. I think I've got a stop for a second. Give me a second. Oh, um, yeah, no problem. Yeah, no problem. We'll take a, a brief pause. All right, so we had some a little bit of technical difficulties there, but uh, we got Myron back with us. Myron talking about, you know, really why it's not as bad as it seems. Just want to give you a chance there to uh, finish your point. Yeah, so I think that definitely, I mean, it's still to show a problem with Biden's, uh, kind of, you know, turnout. Obviously, it's definitely going to hamper him if those, you know, 100,000 people don't turn out, you know, the margin will be down 100,000 from the 2020 margin. But I think that he'll still be able to, you know, even if all those people don't turn out, he'll still probably be able to scrape the state uh, by 50,000. It will just be a lot more precarious because, you know, he's still he's still more popular among white voters and moderate voters than uh, Hillary Clinton was, um, you know, and that's all saying that you know things don't change and i think i think the big thing with this uh this issue has been where kind of democracy and diplomacy collide because i think obviously biden is negotiating a ceasefire i mean he said a day before the primary and he's had his national security advisor you know in israel uh negotiating hostage releases which basically usually are the conditions of ceasefires um but the problem is is that he can't say openly that that's what he's doing or supporting because the whole point of diplomacy is to do things you know behind closed doors because if people make public pronouncements of what they're going to give up and concede it's very hard to do negotiations so i think that biden is stuck in a position where he kind of has to take a position where he's non-committal on ceasefire kind of has to say he's supporting israel because that's the leverage that the americans have in these negotiations um and kind of thus sustain that kind of you know antipathy towards him on this issue yeah i mean i i really think because i just don't get coming from you know just the way i see it, it's like i don't get how you can say that you have the leverage if you're not you know going to come in and show that you're willing to use it and we're definitely going to open more to kind of like a broader discussion on the war uh but i do think it's very interesting just based in terms of the points that you said with um turnout like the the big thing the very noticeable thing in michigan especially is just the lack of turnout among kind of traditional uh, democratic cohorts of the base. And uh, if you look at the way, you know, Biden won last time, it was really because of that just big surge in turnout, a big, you know, because COVID definitely made voting easier. And if you look at, we have Oakland County, uh, some very kind of three interesting counties, the top two counties were uncommitted, uh, two very big counties were, it's called Washtenaw County, which is obviously where you have, or uh, for those of you who know, you've got Ann Arbor, uh, that's the big, uh, home of the biggest college, uh, Michigan University. Um, and then you got uh, Wayne is the is obviously the biggest. Uh, they're but they're both at seventeen percent, but with Wayne with a lot more voters. And in that you got not just Dearborn where you have a you know high percentage of Arab American voters, but you also and this is you know a lot of, very critical. And we've seen you know polls showing this. We've seen kind of anecdotal reports showing this of black pastors, but the black vote uh, in a big way showing up for uncommitted. And you know I don't think you're going to see a big swing towards Trump, but again. Uh, you know, I think it was if just a very, very small percentage of, you know, just black voters in the kind of suburban areas or just sorry, not sub- just the just metro Detroit area had uh, just gone to the polls in 2016. It would have been a completely uh, different story. And another interesting thing is high up there on the well, really kind of right in line with the. With the statewide average is uh, what should have been one of Biden's best places uh, versus uncommitted, which is just, as you said, that kind of the white moderate uh, suburbs uh, where that's Oakland uh, County. A lot of people, it's just the, the part north of Detroit. And that is very interesting. And I, I think that you know kind of goes into the other factor against Biden, which is that age. It is that sense of just the crisis and, and not being able to, you know, whether it be age, whether it just be kind of just general, you know, incompetence for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, it's just the polit- we're seeing more and more evidence that that's the political reality that, uh, you know, a lot of people are kind of saying that you you said, you know, when you came in, the, the, the pitch was restoring the soul of the nation and also, you know, running things in a far less chaotic and crazy way uh, than Donald Trump. And I think that, you know, the age, you know, just whatever you think, just 82 years old finishing the term is just going to be an incredibly 
incredibly uh, you know high number. So I think the fact that we see the age there, and we see also just you know really all parts of. Or, well, the three big parts, at least for Michigan, we have the Arab, we have the young, and we have the black voters, uh, you know, coming out and saying that they're kind of voicing their disapproval. And again, they don't have to go to Trump. All they have to do is just not turn out. And then even still, you know, up in the suburbs, you have Biden's, uh, you know, kind of the, the new Trump era Democrats, I guess you could say. Uh, the people who were kind of repulsed by the just general extremism of the Republican Party. Uh, showing up pretty high there as well, so I think that like those those kind of signs are the key ingredients uh, that Biden was able to use to win last time, and that Democrats were able to use to do well in 2022, uh, and they definitely seem to be kind of on the rocks there. But I mean, again, I think it's kind of because again, a big part of that was also getting a lot of white moderate voters in Michigan who you know didn't turn out in 2016 to turn out in 2020, which doesn't really seem or to straight- be harmed. Yeah, I, I, that is a very good point. We had like, yeah, I think it was like fifty-five percent white women voted for Trump in in uh, twenty sixteen, and that probably just flipped uh, one hundred eighty degrees. But I think the fact that you have the the Oakland County, which is you know those suburbs, uh, are going to be so high up, and the fact that we've seen you know the polls in Michigan be the way that they are, with you know kind of consistent some of the lowest. We have you know if you look at Gretchen Whitmer, who's the governor there, you look at her polls. Uh, if you look at Biden's polls, you know, it's just almost complete reverse with Gretchen Whitmer being way up and Biden being way, way down. Do you think that does that cause you any concern as a someone who's more bullish on uh, Biden? So I think that Gretchen Whitmer has a history of actually, as we saw in the midterms, of outperforming poll averages, I think. And I think that um, you've seen kind of actually throughout the special elections, uh, you know, recently in New York Free, um, you know, the close races in the polls have often actually been a lot better for Democrats um, than seen. And I personally think that's a bias of, you know, one party is a conventional political coalition in the Democrats and the other one is a cult. And, you know, the cult members are going to be more likely to say, we love Biden, you know, I'm sorry, definitely not. We love Trump. We love the Republicans, even if they have doubts, then sort of, you know, Democrats who are more easily kind of um, going to kind of, you know, say their reservations about president or the party. But I mean, I think also, you know, I think actually in the West Belt, you know, Biden actually has, he's trailing, but he's trailing only by about five or three points. And if you average in the margin of error, that that puts it down only to about two to three points, which is way better than, say, in Georgia or Arizona, where he's, you know, trailing by 10 points. So I actually think that he is more favored than in other swing states to um, to take to, you know, meet uh, kind of we take that ground and kind of, um, you know, get back up there. Um, but I do think that, you know, fundamentally, I think that um, at the end of the day, we do have to realize that whatever how high the uncommitted was, you know, whether it was, you know, two points above the regular uncommitted or three points or five points, Biden still won Michigan. He won Michigan with increased turnout. He won Michigan six times the amount of votes that non-committed did. And a lot of that was from the voters that you talk about, you know, you know, especially from, you know, black urban voters. Right. And so I think that, you know, it's definitely a problem. And I think the Biden administration understands the problem, which is why you've had you know, the national security advisor going to Michigan, trying to talk to Michiganders about it. But I think that it is not necessarily going to make him lose Michigan. It's going to make Michigan a lot more precarious and a lot more of a purple state. But it's going to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think. Yeah, Michigan, even really before, I think, the the explosion of kind of everything with regards to the October 7th and the, the war on Gaza, it was already already going to be, you know, it was a pretty tough state. It was, I think, it was uh, 1%, 2% just in it from uh, 2020, uh, 20, uh, you know, and we're already seeing, a, you know, a much closer uh, situation. The fact that this, if you look at the way, you know, things normally go and the, the, the amount of votes, I do have a kind of on the Wikipedia, we had 618,000 uh, uh, for Biden, 101,000 for uncommitted. And then if we go back to Barack Obama, it was, uh, you know, and I think I would pause it, you know, you may, you know, object to this, but I would definitely pause it. You know, the reason we see a uh, big turnout is because people were motivated uh, to come out and, you know, express their anger rather than just, you know, the way we saw with Barack Obama. He only had 194,000 vote election period uh, with 20,000 votes for uncommitted and won kind of more of a uh, 89 percent of the vote versus 81 percent of the vote. Uh, you know, we've seen, you know, A, I think the big surge in turnout, you know, if you look at that, it's it's not for, you know, if it, if it was just for, for Biden, you know, they would say, 
not many people would come out. It would be the kind of the party faithful, you know, uh, would come out and just rubber stamp Biden through Michigan. And I think that's really not what we're seeing. We're seeing a, you know, the the big surge of interest in this uh, is is also you know contributing to you know a big bump in turnout in general. Uh, but I think just the the number of voters that have just expressed their displeasure here is definitely I think more, you know, requires more from Biden than just you know sending you know, the deputy national security advisor to say, you know, we hear you, we see you, we understand you or something like that, you know, if he, if he wants to win. And I I do think, you know, he probably relative to Georgia, uh, where we have exactly those type of white moderates who are, you know, in the Atlanta suburbs, North Atlanta suburbs that are starting to, uh, you know, cool off on Biden for, I would say different reasons. Um, you know, it is, it is definitely, he, he may be in a bit of a better position, but he's still, is in a position that is nowhere like the position he was in in 2020. It's actually far worse. Um, so I think that's you know kind of important to say. And he it was only, if you look at the way the Electoral College uh, votes played out, it was only, I think, under 100,000, at least. I don't remember the exact number, under 100,000 away from a second Trump term in 2020. Well, I mean, I definitely think that kind of, uh, he's definitely not in the place he is in November 2020, because we're not in November 20. 20- 24 yet right so but i think that um at the end of the day that you know i think absolutely that the kind of talk around uncommitted definitely made people more aware of the primary made people turn out but again you know if we want to see why these people turned out we look at you know where has the margin of the votes grown right and and then it looks like both the margin of votes for uncommitted and the margin of votes for Biden also grew, right? Like you didn't just see uncommitted votes, you know, sky from like 10,000 to 100,000. You mm-hmm. also saw uh, votes for Biden go from, you know, during 2012, you know, like 200 or like I think 190,000 to like 600,000. So the spread of those people who were more energized to turn out, the majority did turn out and affirm their support for Joe Biden. Because fundamentally, you know, again, Regardless of what the poll says, when people are asked to actually choose in an election where the stakes actually matter, right, not in some kind of, you know, 800 person poll, they usually overperform their expectations and they usually come out for the Democrats. And I think, you know, I was um, watching uh, the cable news. I do and- think I do think just to be clear, I do think there's a big difference between coming out, you know, for the Democrats versus the Republicans in some side of a situation where Trump and Biden are not on the ballot. But I think. The Trump versus Biden equation for a lot of people is different than the Republican versus Democrat equation. Definitely, definitely. And, and I think, you know, I remember seeing a, a voter be interviewed in Michigan and saying, you know, people are talking about uncommitted. You know, it's too important of an election to be uncommitted. And I think that, you know, you have an equal amount of people, I would say more amount of people, again, just by the vote tallies in Michigan that are saying that than those who are concerned about, you know, Gaza. That doesn't mean that those concerns, you know, aren't a risk for Biden. They definitely are. They make his path to victory a lot narrower. But I don't think it completely means that if he doesn't change his tune on Gaza, um, that, you know, he'll lose Michigan. And again, it is the problem of kind of diplomacy and democracy, which is that to do more, you have to do negotiations. And those negotiations inherently have to be behind closed doors. You inherently have to not tell people about those negotiations, which means that people are going to think that you're doing nothing, which I think is the situation here, I think. Yeah, I, I feel like to look strong in a, you know, democracy and just to look like you're, you know, kind of an effective leader, period, you know, those negotiations, if they've been going on for four months, have to yield some results other than, oh, you know, we kind of just let them just, just, it took forever, but we finally convinced them to let in flour to the refugee camps. And now we're seeing that, you know, even be turned around. So I feel like that, that is really where, you know, a lot of this stuff is coming from. I think with the, you know, diplomacy uh, versus the, the politics of it, it's just the fact that I think people definitely are, you know, willing to be patient, willing to give Biden a chance. But I feel like if we're just seeing time and time again, all these promises or well, the pro- the the first the situation of Biden coming out straight out saying you know the the Palestinian death toll not true, uh, and apologizing for it just well yeah you can go through mistake after mistake after mistake I I would say in terms of just this I, what I think has caused probably the biggest you know c- kind of democratic base dissatisfaction here, um, but you know again the 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 key thing is Biden you know he did win Michigan uncommitted did. I would say, you know, have a significant surge. But the question is, again, how should Biden respond to it? Um, and I think it's, you know, the the n- amount of uh, voters that have expressed this kind of, you know, dissatisfaction with, you know, even in a good year, uh, 
you know, how close Michigan uh, could be. And I would say, you know, that really was kind of a, a high watermark performance for, for Biden in 2020. Um, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a very, very, very tough road to 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 part there, uh, to say the least. Um, what what do you think uh, just generally would be the, the things kind of impacting Biden's campaign and kind of you know shaping uh, Biden's position at the moment? Just yeah, just more more broadly. I think that the main thing is I think obviously a lot of kind of, you know, I think Gaza does just play an important role. I think it's also that people haven't felt the economy yet. I think there's still a lagging indicator on that. Though you are seeing it start to pick up. And I think whether we actually see that translated into poll gains for Biden, I think will determine whether or not Biden's position actually is pretty tricky, tricky and actually is pretty in trouble. I think also what people, a lot of people like us forget is attention, right? You know, most people still aren't watching the election. Most people are going to work, you know, they're having dinner with their families, they're watching, sh- they're watching shows that aren't the news, that aren't cable, right? And they are not going to think about it until summer or, you know, maybe even October or November. And I think that that's especially true because, you know, if you look at the polls, you know, three-fourths of undecideds, the last time I checked, of independents, still think Trump isn't going to be the nominee. They still think that either, you know, the Nikki Hail Mary is going to somehow, you know, deliver her to the nomination. They still think that the courts are going to kind of, you know, trap him in some sort of like a net. Um, you know, so people still really don't understand the choice of Trump versus Biden. And I think once Trump does become the nominee or once Haley drops out or once, you know, it really does kind of hit people that they are going to be making that 2020 choice again even if they don't like it i think that you will see and i hope you do see a significant kind of turnaround um in the polls or at least some movement in the polls um towards biden because i think the biggest thing out of everything is attention people aren't paying attention yet yeah i would definitely say you know it is fair that people you know, definitely true that people don't really pay attention to like you know like the two weeks the kind of the two weeks rule that we hear a lot about, uh, but um, I would also say that I think the, probably a big part of this not wanting to pay attention is just like a real next level, uh, just just general kind of discuss the choices. And I feel like you know I know many many people kind of coming from a relatively you know liberal part of the country that people that would would vote Democrat are used to voting Democrat, uh, but just look at Joe Biden and his age and just see like, you know, th- as, as one factor, even, you know, outside of anything to do, uh, with, with Gaza, um, just see it as just like a, a thing that they just cannot in, in, to really just justify themselves doing. And I, yeah, also like the economy, I think that's definitely going to be, you know, a really, really big deal. And I think the fact that the kind of tough position that Biden is in here is that people are not really going, you know, to credit because we've seen for so long, uh, wages not really keeping up with productivity. So if they see, you know, a wage gain in their own lives, it's going to be, oh, you know, I'm being more productive. I'm deserving that. Uh, but then they see, go to the grocery store. You know, I think the big thing is the price of food being so, you know, sticky in terms of inflation in the United States. That's one big factor. Um, and they say, you know, th- there goes Biden again. You know, so that's going to be a big thing that he's going to have to deal with. Um, you know, on on the economic picture, and then you have just the general age and the kind of competence vibe that, you know, he, a big part of his pitch was just a experienced manager of the country. Um, but, you know, I think that that age puts a big uh, kind of like chink in that armor to say. Uh, but then you have the kind of restoring the soul of the nation, the the leading with decency. I think that a lot of people in, in the base really respect and each you know, horrific picture that we see comes out of Gaza takes a little chunk out of that as well. Uh, just do want to do a quick uh, update on all things to do with Gaza here to end our show. Um, we have a, a, a seem, seems to be a bit of a long way, at least from the Hamas side, uh, to go. Uh, Bassem Naim uh, has told Al Jazeera media that there's uh, they don't seem really satisfied with the condition, seems to mostly be um, you know, they want a kind of longer term ceasefire where Israel is mostly just saying, you know, we're going to get the hostages out and then we're going to just kind of do that Rafa invasion. But we're willing to do a ceasefire for essentially as long as it takes to get the hostages out. I think Netanyahu has said that, you know, the the raid in Rafa will only really be delayed. Um, so the U.N. humanitarian agency, meanwhile, says that humanitarian organizations assist, uh, systematically uh, denied access to Gaza and that humanitarian aid convoys 
uh, are continuing to come under fire. A senior UN humanitarian aid official has said that one quarter of Gaza's population, estimated to be at least 576,000 people, is uh, you know a step away uh, from famine. As we continue to see stories of people, you know, grinding up uh, meat that was meant for animals and then you know just eating it, eating grass, especially in the northern part of Gaza where things are particularly tough. Um, so I just want, want to get your overall kind of reaction about what the the kind of continued attacks that we've been seeing um, on the the aid, but also the uh, continued push towards Rafa uh, in the wake of this kind of potential hostage deal that's kind of going on negotiations with, you know, mostly mediated by people like uh, Qatar. I mean, I think it's horrible. I mean, obviously, I think that's the, that's, that's the immediate response. I mean, I think, you know, I got into politics um, watching what was happening in uh, kind of Syria. Um, and, you know, some of the images really does remind you of kind of, you know, what, you know, Assad did in, in, in Aleppo and Douma, especially the attacks on aid. Um, and so I think it really is it, it is horrible. I mean, I'm glad that they were at least, you know, doing some negotiations. I, I think it is important to, to, to note, though, that kind of, you know, I think, you're very unlikely to see either the Israelis or Hamas say negotiations are, do- are going great because I think both know that there are very large constituencies in their support base that don't want a negotiation. And often, you know, negotiations seem impossible until they actually happen. Uh, because, again, you know, often the only way that you can get people to agree to things is by having them behind closed doors agreeing to those things at the last minute behind closed doors. Um, and so I think that... I mean, I think that definitely actually we have seen some positive signs. I think the firing of the Palestinian government in the West Bank is a really good sign and it being headed by an economist. That seems to be in line with a lot of not only kind of negotiations for a ceasefire, but the longer term plans for kind of a peaceful settlement that involves, you know, a kind of technocratic, uh, you know, uh, PA in charge of Gaza. Um, And, you know, I think obviously Biden's comments, um, you know, the ice cream comments, I think, are... Uh, very encouraging, though. I do a little, worry. a little wish, wishful thinking. I think, uh, yeah, mm, I, I, w- mean, I, I would think... say, but like it is. I think it also it's no coincidence. A month before, you know, Michigan receiving the base, or a week before Michigan receiving the base, kind of continue to get, you know, more and more restless, and or I think you'd say yeah, it was on the eve of Michigan. But um, mm. I think it's mostly going to be um, a political thing. Hopefully, I'm wrong. But, you know, given what we've seen and given especially what the Israeli terms are, uh, it seems like Hamas, you know, is not going to be accepting those anytime soon. And just like, yeah, the distance, especially on the issue of Rafa, I think is going to be, you know, just kind of a real sticking point, uh, whether whether Biden likes it or not. And then, of course, there is, as you said, there is that broader question of the legitimacy of the PA. And I think, you know, it, you do run a really big risk if you're trying to force uh, the Palestinian Authority, you know, kind of on a population that has seen it participate in some pretty bad stuff with the Israelis over the years without, you know, doing some serious reforms in a kind of more egalitarian uh, direction and not essentially just, you know, handing it off to Saudi Arabia or whatever uh, kind of weird collaboration that uh, Brett McGurk uh, in the Biden National Security Office and uh, MBS want to do there. Mm -hmm. But I do think that kind of, um, I I think you want to be cautious and I think that definitely this doesn't mean that like, uh, a peace deal or long-term peace deal is is inevitable or is guaranteed. I think there still needs to be a lot of stuff that is negotiated. I think your white warfare is a big sticking point. Um, I think especially because um, Israeli airstrikes were able to free some hostages in Rafa, I think that um, Netanyahu feels a lot more confident uh, than I think he should um, in kind of going in and, and, and striking. Um, I do think, though, that he... I mean, I think that the IDF really is not going to want to do this. I think that Wafa is an incredibly kind of urban area. Um, I think in order to kind of actually go through it, you'd either need to, you know, bomb it to the ground, which, you know, the Israelis definitely aren't afraid of doing, which I think would be just horrific on so many levels, or they'd have to go house by house, um, you know, fighting it like basically the, the Russians did in Stalingrad, which would be, a tremendous amount of casualties, not only for the IDF, but also for civilians. Um, it's very hard to do urban warfare. So I think that that will definitely, I think, be a constraining factor on when it takes place. I think he set a deadline for, I think it was the 10th of March. Um, so I think we'll have mm-hmm. to see whether or not that that, that deadline um, starts there or gets pushed back. Because, I mean, we do have to remember the initial offensive in Gaza, um, you know, was 
kept saying it was going to be imminent. Actually, it took about a month for it to actually start. Yeah, it was twenty seventh um, or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I think so. I think I think that definitely you're right to be uh, uh, pessimistic. But I think that I mean, again, at the end of the day, we are not going to know the results or the progress of these negotiations because, like all negotiations, they're going to be done in private. They're going to be very, very tightly held when it came to information. One of the worries I think about Biden is that by saying that kind of thing, that there's a hope for a ceasefire, he's actually compromised it. And it does look like Hamas and Israel have kind of poured uh, cold water um, on those hopes immediately after we said it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hope, you know, he was saying that out of a political calculus rather than kind of, you know, a slip up. Um, but I think that there is, you know, we have seen a humanitarian pause negotiated before in this conflict. I don't think it's impossible. And, you know, I hope for the safety of all Gazans. Um, you know, I hope I hope it does, you know, happen, you know. Blessed are the peacemakers, as they say. I, I, yeah, I was very, I was very interested because you, you mentioned the situation with the Palestinian Authority that I was honestly, um, you know, you tried to like read between the lines, the statements of um, Mohammed Shataya, I think that was Shataya, that'd be how you say his name. But he resigned the other day and essentially said that he was, you know, it was signals apparently the Biden administration apparently is hailing as a positive, important step toward achieving a reunited Gaza and West Bank under the Palestinian Authority. Um, And we see the he's been in office since 2019. He said the next stage would essentially just have to take account the fact that Gaza is in a bad situation, essentially stating, you know, the situation just on the ground, not really, you know, putting any kind of opinion on it one way or the other. Um, which was I found to be pretty interesting. So uh, he said the next stage would need to require new governmental and political arrangements that take into account the emerging reality of the Gaza Strip. Um, and then on the same time, we see Hamas um, would uh, not really hating it either, essentially saying the resignation of Shataya's government only makes sense if it comes within the context of national consensus on arrangements for the next phase. Um, you know, and it kind of really vague stuff there, but um, it does... It, the um, we also kind of interestingly saw in the statement the by Shatai it mentioned some sort of effort towards you know, a broader Palestinian unity. Um, mm. So why, w- what was the problem with uh, Shatai in your understanding? Why did he uh, have to go? Well, I mean, I think he represented a you know, I, th- I think he represented you know a lot of people's thoughts about the Palestinian Authority that for the longest time you know uh, it was seen as an arm of basically the IDF. Um, that it was seen as corrupt and nepotistic. Um, I personally think they should have gone a lot farther. I think a boss should at some point go. I think that that at the moment is too much to ask for, especially when there isn't a concrete plan set forth. Um, so I think that this was kind of, you know, in itself a kind of compromise. Um, well, a hopeful one at that. Um, but I think that, yeah, I, I think that people have, you know, thought that, you know, the Palestinian Authority hasn't been able to build up any kind of economic power within Palestine, hasn't been able to really kind of assert its own sovereignty against Israeli occupation. Mm -hmm. And that basically means that, you know, not only people disillusioned with the PA, but it also means that they're more likely to go towards groups, you know, like Hamas. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I I, I think we've heard a lot about um, uh, Mustafa Barghouti in prison. Um, I, I, I'm, I think actually, sorry, Marwan Barghouti, uh, Mustafa Barghouti, I think is part of the, is, is also part of that same group though. Uh, but you know, definitely seems to be you know, finding some sort of, you know, broader leader for the Palestinians, I think definitely would be a good thing. But of course, you know, the important thing is they kind of getting to choose it. Um, and also just, again, as you said, allowing that sovereignty, which I think was been so, uh, handicapping to the Abbas regime, who, by the way, is someone who is not popular uh, among Palestinians at all. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think I that think is. Also, yeah, go ahead. We have the last word there. I, I, I think it's also important to kind of actually have the Israelis, you know, um, allow the, the Palestinians to actually develop themselves. Yes, I mean, you had yes. situations where, you know, I think it was Salam Faid. I don't know, but who kind of, you know, went in with the idea of kind of building sovereignty, you know, unilaterally of kind of, you know, building up the economy of Palestine, you know, actually trying to make it look like a state and thus allow it to be kind of recognized as one rather than doing it the other way around. And, you know, the big thing that he kind of ran into was that the Israelis simply weren't cooperative. You know, they wouldn't uh, kind of, you know, reduce the amount of checkpoints, which means it was harder to actually have a kind of cohesive national economy. You know, they kept building settlements, which, you know, just thousand more settlements just approved. Yeah. So exactly. Right. So I think so I think, you know, 
there's often been the tragedy of Middle East peace has been whenever the Palestinians have been wanting to make peace, the Israelis haven't. And whenever the Israelis have been wanting to make peace, the Palestinians haven't. And so, you know, I think the main kind of trickiness of this whole negotiation is basically trying to, you know, go from, uh, you know, trying to change trains while both of them are moving in the opposite directions, you know, getting both sides to line up at the exact right moment to actually make this deal happen. And I think that's going to be the main challenge of it. All right, Myron, thank you so much. We will end it there. Uh, and we will see you uh, next Monday for Newsflash. And I hope you, Myron, will be able to join us next Tuesday to talk some British politics on Hell Island. Hope so. See ya. All right. See ya. Thank you very much.